Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Jules Netherland. We're going to give people a minute to file in, but we're very excited about uh, the presentation that we have for you today. So please just sit tight while people enter the room, and we will get started shortly. Again, I just want to welcome everybody. My name is Jules Netherland. I work with the Drug Policy Alliance. We are just waiting for uh, others to join us, but we will get started very soon. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started again. Welcome. Uh, my name is, again is Jules Netherland. I'm the managing director of the Department of Research and Academic Engagement at the Drug Policy Alliance. For those of you who might not be familiar with DPA, we're a national organization working to end the war on drugs and my department uh, is working uh, to bridge the divide between research and policy in the field of drug policy. Um, and we do a lot of different things, but one of the things we, we really enjoy doing is profiling um, the ideas and, and works of, of scholars in the field. I'm gonna just give a few announcements. Um, first of all, I hope, I know there's a lot of bad weather in a lot of parts of the country, so I hope that everybody is safe and well today um, and um, warm and dry. Um, I think at this point in the pandemic, we're probably all very familiar with Zoom, um, but just a reminder that um, if you have uh, to follow the chat box, we'll be dropping some links in there as we go along. Um, if you have a question, we're gonna have a discussion at the end of the presentation. You can use the um, Q&A box to enter your questions at any time during uh, the presentation and we'll get to those at the end. Or uh, you can put those in the chat if that's easier for you. Um, a few events I wanted to let you know about. Uh, this is part of our monthly Drug Researchers Roundtable. And next month on March 25th at 4.30 p.m., we're very excited to have historian David Herzberg from the University of Buffalo talking about his new book. Um, and his talk will be about policy lessons from white market drugs. And if you haven't had a chance to hear David present, I really encourage you to join us. Um, he's a, a great presenter and has really important things to say about uh, the way that drugs are sort of bifurcated into white markets and, and markets for people of color. So I hope you join us for that. And my colleagues will drop a link for the registration of that in the chat box. Um, also, uh, just to save the date, um, on April 21st at 1230 uh, to two, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will be doing a quarterly briefing with us and uh, NYU on peer delivered harm reduction interventions to help people uh, experiencing non-fatal overdose in emergency departments. This is a, a overview of their relay program where they're trying to help people who are ending up in emergency rooms um, prevent future overdoses. Um, I also am really excited to announce that just this week we launched a major new initiative called Uprooting the Drug War that looks at all of the ways the drug war has infiltrated our lives in uh, systems. Um, so it's a, a lot of really interesting, important work on how the drug war beyond the criminal legal system impacts things like housing, employment, child welfare, uh, immigration policy. So I hope that you'll get a chance to visit um, our Uprooting the Drug War site, which again, the link is in the chat. A few other quick updates. Um, we uh, help house and start a, a group called uh, the Network of Drug Researchers with Lived Experience. That's a group that's trying to explore if and how 
um, our own experience and positionality as researchers and as people who may or may not use drugs impacts our research. Um, that group uh, under the auspices of Ingrid Walker and um, Daniel Umpad um, is doing a survey trying to solicit the opinions of drug researchers on that very topic. So I hope those of you who are researchers will take a minute to fill out that survey. Uh, I think it's really important data that um, as far as I know has never been collected. Um, so put yourself on the other side of research and be a, a subject instead of a researcher um, and, and make a contribution to that. If you would like to join that group, that network, um, we have a listserv and you can contact my colleague, Eliza Cohen, um, whose email is in the chat and she can add you to that listserv. One other network I wanted to let you know about is that we also have a, a COVID research network for people that are interested in the intersection of COVID and drug policy. Um, and for that uh, group, you can contact my colleague, Sheila Vicaria, and she will drop her email in the chat. Um, and that is a group where researchers and community-based organizations are sharing COVID-related research resources um, on topics ranging from health and harm reduction to decarceration, decriminalization, and drug markets. So if you have an interest in that, um, check that out. And then finally, um, for those of you who are on Twitter and want to uh, tweet about um, today's talk, uh, we, we use the hashtag drug researchers RT for drug researchers roundtable. And if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, our handle is at drug policy nerds. So I am very happy that we have Ayana Jordan to speak with us today. And let me just give a brief introduction and turn it over to her. Ayana Jordan, MD, PhD, is an associate uh, a psychiatry residency program director, assistant professor, and addiction psychiatrist at Yale University. She is a community engaged researcher focused on providing equitable mental health and addiction treatment and preventative services for historically marginalized pop populations. Her extensive research, educational and clinical work has focused on increasing access to evidence-based substance use treatment for black, Latinx and indigenous persons of color, both nationally and abroad. Locally, she leads the faith-based recovery project, Amani Breakthrough, Amani meaning faith in Swahili, held in eight black and Latinx churches throughout the state of Connecticut, helping black, black and Latinx individuals with addiction engage in treatment. We're um, very excited to have her with us today. I'm gonna, without further ado, turn it over to her. And like I said, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, box or in the chat box and we'll get to them uh, later in the afternoon. Take it away, Yana. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Yes, 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 I hope so. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jules, for that wonderful introduction and to the drug policy nerds for inviting me to give this talk. I am feeling more convicted than ever that we need to be very deliberate about building outreach and diversity in the field of addiction. And it is vital <laughs> in order for us to do so uh, because so many lives depend on it. We cannot continue to center white supremacy in the way in which people are taken care of because so many folks are dying. And I think we've seen that, we've been seeing that um, over the last 10 years and we're seeing it even more pronounced um, in this latest pandemic. So I'm gonna talk about building outreach and diversity in the field of addiction. But first, since I am in Connecticut, I always start off with a land acknowledgement, uh, realizing that I am in the land of the indigenous people from seven different tribes who have stewarded this land throughout generations. I thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land. Um, all land in Connecticut was once native territory and I do believe that it's our duty to acknowledge and give thanks um, where we work and conduct research because it really is indeed um, native land. So I say Ashe, uh, I give thanks. Also, I think it's an important point that land acknowledgements do not exist in the past tense or historical context, that colonialism, and I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of how we can be deliberate in building diversity, is a current ongoing process 
we're all a part of it. I'll speak from a place of I, uh, I have to actively decolonize my mind. And I think we have to be mindful of ways in which we um, participate in oppression through colonialism. So just wanna start there. I am a black woman who operates in predominantly white spaces. And I always like to start my talks by centering myself and centering my passion in this work. So I say, stop killing us. This means stop killing black people for sure, but stop killing people who um, use drugs, misuse drugs, have substance use disorders, whatever language that you want to uh, choose. And not only stop killing us literally, right? Policing systems that kill um, people with substance use disorders, minoritized populations, people who use drugs, but also through policies, right? Racist drug policies, which is why I'm so grateful to have an organization like a DPA in the mix to hold folks accountable. So I cannot go forward without paying homage to the lives that have been lost publicly that we know of. Breonna Taylor, she still very much present. I go to bed thinking about her, not as often as usual, but I always want to have her present because she was a victim of our racist policies. Holding up Danielle Prude, holding up Walter Wallace, all who were victims to the racist war on drugs. So when I talk about building outreach and building diversity in addiction, it's not just because it's something nice to do. Literally, lives depend on it. So for the next 30 seconds, and I'm going to put on a timer, I'd like us to just, wherever you are, hold for 30 seconds to honor the humanity of Black people and those who have lost their lives um, to the racist war on drugs. Thank you so much. It never ceases to amaze me how long 30 seconds feels like um, when you're just sitting in silence. And I think that's important because for almost nine minutes, the officer had their knee on the neck of George Floyd. And I think that that is um, an accurate metaphor for what's happening right now in terms of how people with addiction are treated. Um, policies and the way on which our system provides care, figuratively their necks are on, are their, their, their needs are on the necks of many folks. Okay, so Walt Whitman, this is a poem from the 1900s, 239 thought of equality as if it harmed me, giving others the same chances and rights as myself, as if it were not indispensable to my own rights that others possess the same. And this is kind of my value system in terms of taking care of people um, with addiction, specifically substance use disorders and their right to live a life worth living on their terms. This is the lens, the perspective of which I look through. So everyone who's in attendance, we are now in a liberated space. So what do I mean by that? I want you to feel free to show up in this space in any way that you would like. You don't have to worry about being respectful. You don't have to worry about um, asking a question that might not be politically correct. Really putting out into the chat and later when we have discussion, those thoughts that are necessary in order to engage in discussion that's going to move the needle in terms of how do we build diversity and addiction? How do we better take care of people 
and understanding that you might say something might, that might hurt someone's feelings. That is okay because oftentimes within that conflict comes growth. Push back against some of the ideas that I present. You know, I encourage you to, to um, put some new ideas. This is how we really rage against the machine and really think about new ways of doing things. So we're in this liberated space. Luckily, I'm able to um, live in an authentic way, which is why I have my door knockers on because I'm like, this is who I am. This is how I'm giving this talk. So I encourage you all, even if it's just for this next hour and a half to join in this liberated space with me. Okay, these are the disclosures. I am a board member of the board of trustees. These are my views. Hopefully one day these will be the views of the APA, but they're not. So I'm speaking from a place of I and I do not have any um, disclosures no financial conflicts. Let's get into the presentation. What am I going to talk about today? Three overarching themes. One, the importance of promoting diversity and inclusion in addiction, why it's beyond the right thing to do. Why is this important to, to even strive um, to create systems that are more diverse? The state of the field in science broadly and addiction specifically, what science is supported, what is the clinical landscape? I'll give you some data that's really based in the literature that we have. And then I'd like to spend a lot of the time before we get into discussion with solutions, resources for accountability for improved health outcomes for people with addiction. And this is not at all exhaust, exhaustive, but these are some of the thoughts that I've curated over my time doing work in this field. So let's get started. The importance of promoting diversity and inclusion and in addiction. What is the point? Why do we strive for diversity? Um, and I have the references at the bottom of the screen. I'm happy to share. A lot of this is from a paper that we published in the Journal of, um, on Addictions, talking about how you build outreach and diversity and addiction. So I encourage you to go and read that paper um, if you need more details. But basically, it's important because it gives us a better understanding of our patients, our clients, our research participants. So people who come from diverse backgrounds have di differing points of view, racial, gender, sexual um, classifications and identities all help to cre create empathy and also really produce ideas that are more diverse, right? So that leads to a better understanding of the population on which we're trying to treat. Also, and this is a lot from the um, economics literature, and again, we have these references in our paper, diverse teams perform better. So what do I mean by that? They have more access to innovation and creativity, new ideas. Um, and this was really seen uh, uh, at Google, and really thinking about if you want to create environments where you can attract diverse folks, it's easier to retain and recruit talent when you already have a diverse team. Also, in terms of um, performing better, you're able to create, disseminate, and then evaluate culturally tailored care in a way that more homogeneous um, environments cannot. So not only are you creating more culturally relevant interventions, but also thinking about ways in which you can evaluate to see if those interventions are actually effective for the communities in which you're trying to serve. And we do that with Imani, we do that with the Black Church Project, and I'll talk a little bit about more of that later. And then finally, in terms of addiction specifically, it actually increases initiation rates for um, treatment in traditional settings of care, but also it, it actually improves retention and minimizes attrition rates for black and indigenous persons of color uh, with addiction and treatment. And ultimately that leads to improved health outcomes. So we just, submit a, just submitted a paper to Lanza Psychiatry when we were looking at people with um, mental illness, not necessarily addiction, but anxiety and depression from minoritized backgrounds. And 
one of the things that they were able to identify from thousands of folks is that they wanted to be able to engage with physicians that look like them that came from the minoritized background. The problem is that they did not have access to the physicians that look like them. So there is this um, wanting and belief that if they're taken care of by a more diverse workforce or people that actually look like them, that they would be better cared for. So these are all reasons why we have to really strive for diversity. So having an understanding of DEI is essential. And I changed it because of before I used to say DIE, which is like die, which is like part of it is all, all of these DEI programs really just ways to, to create committees so the efforts can die. So I want to kind of revitalize and say diversity, um, equity, inclusion. What do we mean by that? And I want us to all be on the same page in terms of language. So diversity in this context is really thinking about the workforce, institutions, organizations, community programs that represent the heterogeneity of the people that we're trying to help. So in this case, people with addiction, right? People who want to initiate recovery. And when I say diversity, I'm not just talking about racial diversity. That's one part of it. And we'll get to intersecting identity soon, but thinking about diversity in the broadest sense, what about ability, you know, including people who are um, of various abilities, right? Um, thinking about diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, um, gender diversity, you know, sexual minority diversity, all of this is important. And how can you be deliberate to attract people from very diverse backgrounds? So having the institutions of organizations represent the heterogeneity of the population that you're trying to um, treat. Equity is that everyone has access to what is needed for success, right? Which is very different than equality, but I guess just wanna make sure we're on the same page. Everyone is going to need something different. And we have to be able to create the scaffolding to make sure that this person gets what they need, which might be very different than what somebody else needs. And how can we create those systems that are more equitable? And then finally, having an inclusive environment. And inclusion means that barriers seen or unforeseen are eliminated. eliminated. So people truly feel value and appreciate it as themselves. Not that they feel value or appreciate it because they have to uphold um, an oppressive framework, but that they, they can show up and truly be themselves. That will allow for them to be able to be fully involved in decision making and feel empowered that they can actually make change in whatever system that they're working in. And so that is really inclusion. And those are the principles that we're operating on. Now, remember, people say, oh, yeah, we have DEI initiatives, we have a diverse working group, it's inclusive, but how can you really be inclusive if you're not always thinking about the intentions and how um, it's being operationalized? So what do I mean by that? Intent doesn't always equal impact. So you might have a diverse group. So you might think, but what are the outcomes of that diversity? So what do I mean? Such that certain people might actually harbor biases um, that make other people feel excluded. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a conscious bias. A lot of it is unconscious, meaning the people are not aware of them, but it can still make people feel excluded. An example, you can have many different men, males from different um, perspective races, but they will still be more likely to invite male colleagues to sit on panels. And we see that all before, we, it's called manals. So really being intentional about not just diversity of a perspective and thought and race, that's important, but diversity all the way around, right? And then this is, um, this is from, the chair of microbiology and immunology at Yeshiva University, where I trained, he said, put at least one woman on the team that organizes a scientific symposium, and that team will be much more likely to um, invite speakers. And we see this uh, in terms of behavioral research, 
When you have people who are different, they're more likely to look for those that reflect themselves, right? Reflect their image. So really wanting to be intentional about, um, about the, uh, the systems that we create. And then this just happened to me the other day in terms of a predominantly white group may not recognize BIPOC are not contributing or speaking up in the majority group setting. I was in a meeting for, um, anyway, it doesn't matter what I was in a meeting for, but the bottom line is that I was the only um, black folk person on in the meeting and the white men continued to talk over me without any uh, awareness of what was going on, right? And so finally it had me to say like, listen, if one more person talks over me, I'm done, right? So oftentimes people who are minoritized made to feel less than are more likely to be attuned to these predominant um, social interactions. And so that's why it's important to have them included, right? But also feel empowered to speak up. Okay, a few other points to consider before we move on to the state of where we're at right now. But what about intersectionality? And so this is really the, um, the term that was created by Kimberly Cr Crenshaw and thinking about connectivity of social cate categorizations based on many different intersecting identities, race, class, gender, sexuality, positionality, and ability. And all of these have to be attended to when we're thinking about um, diverse systems. So it's not enough to just check the box in terms of race, class, that all of these other um, uh, considerations have to be taken into account. Don't assume that you can see a, a, a disability. And I love this quote from Roxane Gay. She's the author of Hunger, amongst many other things. It's exhausting because people don't think, they just assume that everyone fits in the world like they do. So really needing to have these different beings in the world to be able to bring forth thoughts that you can't even attend to because it's just not in your consciousness because you've never experienced it. So this is what we were saying in terms of building diverse teams, having all of the folks at the table to be able to attune to the need. All right, so let's move on towards the National Institutes of Health, which is one of the largest federal agencies, second only to the DOD, that actually uses taxpayers' money to fund the research um, that is conducted in this country. What did they say about diversity? And I just wanna read the diversity statement. Fostering scientific innovation, enhancing global competitive, competitiveness, contributing to robust learning environments, improving the quality of the researchers, advancing the likelihood that underserved or health disparity populations participate in and benefit from health research and enhancing public trust. So this is their statement on why diversity is important for scientific innovation, competitiveness, robust learning environments, improving the quality of research, advancing the likelihood that people from underserved populations will actually participate in research and enhance public trust. So this is what they say. But now let's look at what actually do they do. My mom always says, don't believe what people say, believe what they do. So that's the second part of the presentation. What is the state of the field in terms of building the diversity in our science? and then looking at the workforce of addiction specifically. Guys, it's five o'clock now, so I got 30 more minutes before we talk. The bottom line is that we are in a state of crises. Stevie Wonder could see that, okay? We are doing horribly in terms of supporting diverse types of research, period, all across the board. But definitely when we're looking at the workforce and addiction specifically. You don't have to believe me, let's look at the research. So this was a paper from 
10 years ago that was published in science in terms of race, ethnicity, looking at people who actually get research awards. Here I'm showing you a graph on the X axis or going across horizontally. These are the race and ethnicities of folks who were actually awarded NIH grants, all right? Blue is black or African-American people. Red is Asian folks. Green, Hispanic or Latinx. Purple is white and then gray is all together. On the Y axis or the vertical line that's going up and down, these are the folks that were awarded, the probability of getting awarded at R01, which is a um, kind of a gold standard to be able to do independent research. Black applicants are 13.2 percentage points and Asian applicants 3.9, less likely to receive funding, NIH funding, compared to white applicants, all right? So then you might say, okay, Dr. Jordan, or maybe Ayana, because some of my patients call me Ayana in terms of doing what we need to do for improved health outcomes. Maybe there's something about the Black applicants in particular, they're not as competitive, maybe they don't have the mentorship necessary, and that's why they're not getting funded to do the research. So unfortunately, that's not the case. All things being equal, the outcome is still bad, right? So after controlling for educational background, country of origin, their training, their previous research awards, their publication records, and even where they worked at before, Black applicants still remain significantly less likely than white people to be awarded NIH funding by 10 percentage points. So what does that mean? I, I wanna make it very plain. That means that these folks are less likely to actually carry out the scholarship, be given the resources to carry out the scholarship that's necessary to create the programs needed to take care of the populations, right? So more bad news here. If we look at people who went through that process and said, okay, I'm gonna try again. At first you don't succeed, try and try again. Black and Asian in investigators were still less likely to be awarded an R01 on the first or second attempt. So even if they tried again, they were less likely to be funded. And for those who were not funded initially, Black and Latinx investigators were less likely to resubmit a revised application. And then finally, Black investigators that actually do resubmit, although they're less likely than white people to resubmit, but if they do resubmit, they have to do so more often to receive an award. So this is the data that I want us to focus on because when we're thinking about solutions to this, we have to understand inherently how racist the policy, the structure is, that even when you're controlling for all of the things that is important, people from minoritized backgrounds are still not able to get funded. So what is going on? It can't just be making more diverse study sections. Yes, that's important, but we have to look at the very system itself that creates minimal success, right? All right, now let's move on to the institutions themselves because we're that is looking at the race and ethnicity of the applicant. But what about the institutions where these people come from in terms of their ability to get awarded NIH funding? On the X axis or the horizontal axis, the part that's going across, these are just looking at the type of research organizations, how much NIH funding that their organization already got. And then on the Y axis, the one that's going up and down or vertically is the percentile that they'll actually get the R01, that independent grant. Here is just showing you that if you come from a non-academic institution, that you're less likely to get funded. So people who are not affiliated with academia are less likely to be funded. Why is that the case? Who made that decision? That people who are not in academia don't have 
as robust research topics that they need to pursue. But then also, if you come from an institution that is affiliated with academia, but doesn't already get a lot of NIH funding, you're at a disadvantage itself. So what if because of finances or personal reasons or a host of things that I want to attend a university that is affiliated, right? That is an academic institution, but just doesn't have as much NIH money I'm already at a disadvantage, regardless of my background, in order to get funding. So this was 10 years ago, y'all. So then I'm going to speed up to 2019. We're seeing the same thing because nothing has changed in terms of fixing this problem. People keep saying pipelines, pipelines, pipelines. Pipelines are not going to fix the data that we're seeing here, right? even after you control for all those things. So here we are, 2019, this comes out, again, in Science Advances, it says, research topic preference contributes to persistent funding gap in NIH research grants to Black scientists. And there's a whole paper that they go on, and I have the um, reference at the bottom, that talks about why is this the case, right? 20% funding gap for black scientists compared with white scientists. Black applicants as a group are more likely to propose research topics that are less likely to be funded. These research topics are more likely to be health outcomes research, implementation research, actually interventions on the ground. That's what that means. And then if they looked at what are the disparate, the disparate outcomes between black and white scientists, uh, there's three decision points. One, that they're not even being selected for discussion, their ideas, that the impact score, which is a score that shows that is like how important this research is, with one being very, very good and nine being not good, that the impact score is higher, which is bad for Black scientists, and that the topics that they are more likely to pursue, which happen to be health outcome and implementation things, right? affect their ability to get funded. Then they say reviewers and study sections have preference for research topics that tend to have methodologies that are highly controlled with very precise outcomes. So what does that mean? If you're working with heterogeneity in your population, people from many different backgrounds, people may who may be dealing with trauma, people who may have co-occurring mental illness and addiction, people who also have serious medical problems like infectious diseases because they use drugs or inject drugs. These are the populations that we need to study the most, but reviewers tend to shy away from these topics because they can't be highly controlled. So already there is inherent bias in this selection, right? What is a big thing? Oh, I grew up in a black church, y'all. So I love call, call and response. It's hard for me because I can't hear y'all. But what is the big, big thing? Just put it in the chat and we'll talk about it. That is missing from this paper looking at the persistent funding gap. Nobody talked about racism. It's like, how are you going to write a whole paper that is based on work that you knew happened 10 years ago that doesn't talk about the role of racism in this, right? And then to add insult to injury, this was a press release from the head of the NIH, Director Francis Collins. He said, these results were a surprise. Research topics that were less funded are vitally important. We need to understand whether there is an intrinsic bias against such topics by reviewers or whether the methodologies used in those fields of research need an upgrade. Again, distraction from the problem, distraction from the oppressive systems that got us here, distraction from the role of racism, really focusing instead on the methodologies used in these fields. Why would there be poor methodologies used in research that is focused on health outcomes implementation and how thinking about 
privilege and positionality. How you, can you be the director of NIH and actually be surprised by this when similar work was released 10 years ago? I didn't need a paper as a black woman who works with people who use drugs. I didn't need a paper to know that these were the results. So this is what I mean in terms of really needing to be deliberate about diversifying our leadership. And this is the person who's responsible. You, you don't have, there's no luxury to be surprised when we're literally losing people's lives as a result of lack of access to research that is going to move the needle on what we need to do. So you can see, and I'm still mad about it. I text my mentor, Carl Hart. I said, Carl, we have got to write something about this. These people are losing it. They have the nerve to have a press release this and this. So I hope you guys, I encourage you all to read the letter to the editor that was published. But we said that it's deeper than research topic choice. We had a fundamental response, really dismantling point by point what is said in the paper. And the first thing we said is, you can't talk about these systems without talking about racism and how you have to be deliberate in dismantling racism. And we actually gave them some examples of what they can do in order to have a fair system, right? And so I encourage you all to, to read a little bit more about that. But I'm gonna keep on going because I wanna get to addiction in particular. Is it any better in addiction clinical care? News alert, you guys already know it's not better or else I wouldn't be here figuring out how to build diversity, okay? But I just want you guys to see the literature of how bad it is. And again, I point you to the paper that I did with my awesome mentee, Oluwali Jegede, where we looked at how do you build diversity in addiction specifically, but what is the state of the nation right now? I just want to bring your attention, and this is data from the ACGME, the accrediting body, looking at trainees, so people who are not yet out in the addiction workforce, but they're still in training, right? Addiction medicine trainees, addiction psychiatry. That's what the ADM is, addiction medicine. ADP is addiction psychiatry. This is the um, number just the raw number and then in parentheses is the percentage of the folks that make up that particular race or ethnicity. And here I'm just showing you, I just wanna draw your attention to the Hispanic, Latinx, Black and Native American. There are zero, as of 2018, zero trainees in addiction medicine for Black and Native American, four, only four, from Latinx backgrounds in addiction medicine and only four for Latinx backgrounds in addiction psychiatry. And we didn't do much better in psychiatry for black people. The trainees were only three and one indigenous person. So then I say, okay, let's look at the folks like me who are already done with training, board certified, or not, not even necessarily board certified, just in training, past training, that are actually out giving care. Again, the numbers are dismal, and this is more updated. This is as of January, 2020, so last year, looking at the race and ethnicity profile of practicing addiction psychiatrists. And as you can see, out of about 1,200 or so practicing addiction psychiatrists, less than 10% are from minoritized backgrounds. It's terrible, guys. We're doing a awful job at recruiting and also retaining minoritized folks in the field. And I like to use the word minoritized because in the world, black and brown people are the majority. But in this United States broadly, we are made to feel less than. So that's why I say it's an action, right? We are minoritized, made to feel other less than the majority race. Okay, so that's where we are. Finally, I'm going to spend the next 15 to 20 minutes before we get into discussion on solutions or resources for how we might create some accountability and improve outcomes for people in addiction. What are the things that we need to do upstream 
to help the folks on the ground. Community solutions. And when I say community, I mean that in the broadest sense, having everyone be involved. So the name of my lab, and I don't call it a lab, but the name of the research group that I'm over is called Jordan Wellness Collaborative. Collaborative because people from all different walks of life, all different schools of thought, all different expertise have to come together for the solution. One of the things that I'm really, really excited about, and I have a couple of slides on this, is the program that I'm the medical director of. It's called REACH, Recognizing and Eliminating Disparities in Addiction Through Culturally Informed Healthcare. Reachgrant.org is the website. I encourage you all to go. You can follow us on Twitter at Program Reach. But this is in its infancy, and it's the only program like that of, of this nature in the nation. When we are unapologetic about two goals. One, that we are focusing on training and, and recruiting people from minoritized backgrounds who want to be addiction specialists. You don't have to be a physician. You just have to be able to prescribe at this time, but I'm trying to broaden that. We welcome APRNs, we welcome nurse trainees, residents, medical students, of course, fellows, because we want to make sure that you have access to the education for you to be successful in taking care of minoritized populations, but we're specifically focusing on minoritized um, populations. Um, all right, and then we say we want to help them take care of people who have been minoritized who also have um, problems with addiction. And how do we do that? What is the instruction that's necessary? Knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are necessary to do that. And so I'm just providing some highlights of the things that we go over. First of all, you have to have a deep understanding of racism and how it affects health and specifically addiction. So we have the amazing Courtney Cogburn. She gave a lecture about how racism permeates everything and has really influence the type of care in which people receive who um who have substance use disorders we also go over things like the anthropologic aspects of um urm care helena hansen gives that lecture the history and epidemiology of addiction samuel roberts gives that lecture understanding how people from minoritized backgrounds have to because of racist policies, obtain care and carceral systems. we have lisa puglisi, puglisi who that gives that lecture so we are very clear in our instruction of the topics that are high yield in order for you to best take care of people from minoritized populations. Another thing in writing this grant for this program that I was very intimately attuned to is that you people have to get their coins. They have to get their money in terms of being able to support themselves. So one of the things that we know, again, because of structural racism, is that people from minoritized backgrounds, even when you get to this level of training, have more debt, are less likely to continue their training because they don't have access to money to be able to support themselves or their family. So I was very deliberate in making sure that there was adequate money to be able to participate in this program so that people would have the privilege of being able to take another year just to learn. So all of that to say they get money, okay, so that they can be able to do this. And so when thinking about building scaffolding for outreach programs, this has to be part of it, right? It can't just be like, oh, let's work with this population. How do we take care of the comprehensive whole? And then I just threw this in because I love my REACH scholars. They're amazing. This is the um, current cohort. And we just accepted our cohort that it will be starting in July. But I do wanna say that if you, know of anyone who is interested from a minoritized background that's interested in learning how to take care of people with addiction who are minoritized please send them to reach we're going to be accepting our fourth cohort that starts next year in july 2022 and that application goes live next month so reachgrant.org and you can just see for yourself in terms of um how awesome our scholars are they're from all over 
Some are in the military, some are not. Some are in recovery, some are not. We have diversity in, in terms of where they come from, some OBGYNs, infectious disease, nursing, people have background in social work, people who come from very poor communities, people who come from affluent communities. We have it all and I'm very grateful and this is very deliberate. Okay, another program that I just wanna bring your attention to is called LEAD. Stands for Learning for Early Careers in Addiction and Diversity Program. REACH, is more on the services side, right? Actually providing clinical services where Lee is on the research side. And I wanna talk briefly about this infrastructure of how do we um, support minoritized scholars who want to do work in addiction. And I was a lead scholar and it helped me to be part of now the less than 1% of black scholars that actually have a R01 grant. Right? Um, so I wanna highlight this program. The goal is to increase the number of minoritized researchers to receive NIH funding, exists within this larger NIDA network. The NIDA stands for National Institutes of Drug Use. I don't say abuse because I think the language needs to be changed. It's outdated, it's stigmatizing. So that's why I call it drug use. And then just so you know what CTN does, it is a community of researchers, community-based providers in this nation that is committed to creating new treatment options and optimizing things that we know that already work to figure out how to up to implement it on a larger um, scale. So that is what LEAD is. And again, I have the Twitter handle here for people who are interested in pursuing research, specifically taking care of minoritized folks with addiction. Um, I encourage you all to look at LEAD. It's an awesome program. Okay, but even with these programs, I want you to know that it's still based in the current structure of doing things as we usually do it, taking care of people the way in which we've been socialized to do, getting research from NIH. And so this had me thinking as I prepare this, <sighs> Colonization is a, I can't say it y'all, but maybe if you catch me not giving this presentation, I would use the language, but colonialization is terrible. What do I mean by that? And I put this sweatshirt on, my mentee and good friend, uh, Latha Swami got me this sweatshirt and it says, colonized minds create colonized solutions to colonize problems. And that's from Health Equity Solutions. And this helped me to understand that even though I really try and stick it to the man and not become a cog in the will of white supremacy, all I mean by that is norms, cultures, and ideals that favor the way in which white people operate as opposed to other identities and other cultures, I still am a part of, um, a, col a colonialist framework. So I have this in my presentation to remember, if we want different results in terms of how we take care and provide systems for people with addiction, we have to do things differently. So as much as I wanna support REACH and I will continue and even LEAD, we have to examine, and this is the work of Helena Hansen, shout out, cite black woman, in terms of examining the master or predominant narrative of scientific enterprise. What does that mean? That we have to rethink what Carl Hart and I talked about in the paper in response to the topic choices, right? We have to examine and be able to critically reflect on the structures that continue to rely on pipeline programs that have not changed the atmosphere in terms of what happens to people with addiction on the ground. They're not getting better care. So if we say, okay, let's totally ignore pipeline programs because we know that those are not working. They're necessary, but not sufficient. How can we focus our attention now on the source of racial equalities in addiction? How can we use our language instead of saying the social determinants of health, but be very clear in saying structural racism 
is a system in of itself that upholds many different systems, right? To uphold the master or predominant narrative in terms of keeping things as the status quo. So we have to think about, can we create different systems that have nothing to do with the existing narrative? And how can we not fall into a usual narrative of someone being othered and rewrite the narrative? And this is Wisdom Powell, and this is what she said. Don't fall into thinking about someone as an addict. And I don't use that language, but I'm just trying to prove a point. In terms of looking at folks as problems to be solved, which is how the predominant master narrative functions right now and looking at people who misuse drugs or who have addiction. That there are problems to be solved, that there's inherently something wrong with them and that the system has to, you know, save them in some way, as opposed to what Wisdom Powell says, wonders to behold. And what do I mean by that? I'm saying that looking at and approaching the issue like, wow, folks are actually functioning in a system that does not affirm their humanity, that is very oppressive, that doesn't deal with their trauma, that doesn't take and take into account how difficult it is to be other in society, and yet they are still surviving some way. How can we tap into the wonders of their survival, be able to create systems of care that reify their strength, as opposed to always looking at them in a way that's deficient? And admittingly, that's something that I didn't even think about critically. And so restructuring our brains to operate in a different way of deficiency, but strength-based. This is why I love the work in terms of this TED Talk that Shamamanda Ngozia Adichie says, the danger of a single story. If we hear only a single story about another person or a country, we risk a critical misunderstanding. And I think I can ascribe this logic to people with addiction. If we focus so much on them being deficient or something's wrong or that they need to be fixed, we miss all of the other factors that come into perspective in order to take care of them. So we spend time on patronizing and you know we're well-meaning, but giving having pity on people and looking at them as that they're not really equal that they're not someone that we might be able to have a powerful connection with, right? And not allow this concept of othering. And I have this police brutality picture here and I encourage you all to um, read a paper that we just published in Lancet Psychiatry when we say being black should not be a crime or something like that. It talks about um, having, if you're black and you have a mental illness, how much of a higher risk you are to die from um, having encounters with the police. But when we focus on people with addiction as not having value, not having worth, this allows us to treat them in the ways that we treat and develop policies that don't see their humanity, right? Allow for us to send them to jail as opposed to get help, right? Allow them to be engaged with police as opposed to communities of care that actually have their best interests. So we have to speak truth to power and be deliberate in the ways in which we uphold master or predominant narratives that are not helpful or kind to people who, who use substances. So I just wanna distill some of the things that I've been talking about. What is the, some of the necessary elements for diversity in addiction leadership? You have to have, this is again, wisdom pal, deep empathy for people who are most affected. So you can't design interventions from communities who you don't fundamentally love. In order to do this work, you have to have a fundamental love and, and need for liberation of folks who have been minoritized, marginalized, and historically and presently oppressed in order to truly take care of people with addiction. You have to have a commitment to work in communities that have been othered, and we talked about that, made to feel less than, made to feel like there's no value, they're worthless, they don't have any humanity. 
you have to have a belief that people can actually indeed heal, grow, and thrive, right? I don't care who, what their urine talk said. Like, I don't care. People come into the clinic, Dr. Jordan, my urine's clean, my urine's clean. I say, I don't care. What I'm fundamentally concerned about is how are you doing? How are you feeling? How were you treated when you came through these doors? Were you treated with care and value? How did my team interact with you? Because this is what's important in terms of building the leadership necessary to take care of folks with addiction. You also have to have a commitment to anti-racism and that's just because it's in vogue and America woke up to racism last year, but because this will allow us to operationalize systems that are truly equitable. And this is some of the elements in that is needed to have an anti-racist approach to addiction. You have to have voices from Black, Indigenous persons of color. They have to be included in the narrative. So there's no work that I do, not in my clinical work, my research, or my teaching, that I don't do that actually involves people who I'm trying to help or trying to include in the narrative. So that means that I have community-informed expertise, CIE, from people who take drugs because it's important for them to have a seat at the table. A deep understanding that leaders have to be cultivated, right? There has to be an element of maturation and growth. Not everybody just grows up to be a leader if you didn't have access to the necessary uh, resources in order to do that. There has to be a process in which to cultivate leadership so that folks are involved in all stages of public policy and implementation work. And health programming in general, especially in addiction, have to attend to the needs of BIPOC folks who use drugs by removing current and historic barriers to health. And we can get into ways in which structural racism propagates that, different waiting times, people having to show up you know, at a 2.30 appointment when you know that they can't because they don't have access to transportation or something like that. Why not just have an open access system where they can come when they can come, right? So these are one of the examples of current barriers to health or not providing methadone in primary care clinics, which is much easier for people to get access to their medication as opposed to having them going to opioid treatment programs to get the medication that they need that might be an hour and a half away. This is what I mean about current barriers. It's not just in the past, it's happening now. And informing yourself of these barriers that exist so that you are able to build more diverse, inclusive systems. And then attending to, again, um, the social determinants or the structural determinants in your treatment planning. I want to pivot, and I'm almost there, y'all. I have a few more points that I want to make. I realize it's 533, but hang in there with me. We'll be able to talk about the importance of focusing on HBCUs and being able to recruit people to do the work. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to end with some of the research that we're doing that is more equitable and diverse. So why do I have three or four slides related to HBCUs? And I have it because we need to look at systems that have been able to successfully recruit minoritized folks into leadership positions and learn from them. And that is what I think is a big, big part of addiction leadership that we're missing. Engagement with HBCUs, which stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. There's more than 100 in existence. To be exact, there's 107. Um, I always like to include this because my mom went to HBCU, my dad went to HBCU. They said, Ayana, you could go wherever you want to go, but we're only paying for you to go to HBCU. So I ended up going to Hampton University. Shout out to the real HU. Um, and they were founded, many HBCUs were founded by churches or philanthropists in terms of demanding access to education for folks who otherwise would have not have been able to go to school. And then I just want to point out that HBCUs produce over 70% of the doctors that we have in this country. 
So when we're looking at those numbers that I presented to you earlier about zero trainees for addiction medicine, Black or Latinx, four for addiction psychiatry, we have to look at the institutions that have already done this and trained 70% of Black physicians. Um, and I'm just showing you here some of those places where the HBCUs that actually produce most of the, um, the doctors. Xavier, shout out to Xavier, Spelman, and Bennett. Then, because it's my talk, I wanted to focus a little bit about on my, my um, alma mater, Hampton University, because it has one of the most robust programs in terms of helping people get to do a career in the health profession. It's called the School of Science Pre-Med Program. Okay, it was established some years ago. The point is that this program single-handedly undergraduate has sent 211 students to medical schools all throughout the country, already more trainees than um, we have in addiction medicine, but also 97% of them are black. So why aren't we focusing on these institutions that are already trying to do what we cannot do um, specifically? Another thing that I wanted to say is where do these folks end up going? Because one of the critiques I hear is like, oh, you were trained at HBCU. You don't know what it is to work in predominantly white institutions or predominantly white spaces. And the point is that is all myth and, and um, total BS because these folks go all over. And I'm just showing you some places that they're more likely to go. All right, so let's get into what is it about this partic these particular institutions that help folks from minoritized populations, specifically from Black backgrounds succeed. And I really tried to list all of the things that have been studied and shown in the literature to support the success. You have to be intentional, dedicated to the scholarship and success of these minoritized folks. Culturally supportive, cultural diversity, economic diversity, right? Um, you know, all the things, having high standards for success. You can do this, uh, fostering a sense of pride in your identity. So counteracting the narrative of being othered or being marginalized. There's no URM or minoritized identity because everybody looks like you, right? And again, we talked about the legacy of providing opportunities to folks who otherwise would not have opportunity. Why is this relevant to addiction? Because these are the traits that we need to be consistent and deliberate about when we're thinking about creating scaffolding in ways that can recruit diverse heterogeneous um, populations to leadership with an addiction. All right. I am going to stop in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to just talk about two projects that we're doing in the Jordan Wellness Collaborative, all based in community-based participatory research or CBPR, the type of research that's less likely to be funded by the NIH. Um, partnership approach to research that equitably involves, right, giving people what they need to succeed, community members that community-informed expertise, key stakeholders, Black people who actually use substances, and researchers, having them all involved in the research in order to bring about success. Um, this is kind of the values that uh, operationalize CBPR, supporting research that happens where people live, work, pray, and play. So really trying to just transition away from traditional settings of care, but thinking about where are people at on the corner stores, the bodega, shout out to NYC, barbershops, places of worship, community centers where people already are at and figuring out how to provide care um, or support in those communities. Having a, having a radical vision, it's like radical to who, but at least to um, traditional ways in which people do research not caring about the urine toxicology reports, but the quality of life, recovery markers. Are you able to get a job? Are you able to take care of yourself and your family? These are the metrics that we use to measure success as opposed to did you use or not use, right? 
and then focusing on the population level as opposed to individual level interventions. If we know that whole zip codes can dictate how people live, then why not have addiction interventions that really operate on a population level as opposed to one-on-one? -on -one? And then finally, incentivize timely interventions to reduce things like the research to action gap, how long it takes to actually implement the research that we know that works, research to practice, how long it takes to operationalize taking care of patients based on research, and finally, minimizing the research to policy gap. So knowing what works and actually translating that to policy. Those are the values that inform the Jordan Wellness Collaborative. Um, I just want to briefly mention the Imani Breakthrough Project. Stay tuned and I'll happily reach out to the drug policy nerds to talk about the paper um, when, it, when it's published in terms of all the work that we're doing with Imani Breakthrough. The deliberate support, payment, and um, leadership of community-informed expertise, minoritized folks with addiction who are leading this project. And I wanna shout out Sherelle Bellamy, who's the co-PI of this project, um, who is someone with lived experience, who is now a professor at Yale. Um, and she is in recovery from substance use and mental illness. I don't have time to go into the key aspects of the program, but again, it'll all be in the paper and I'll share that. Um, and then I'll touch on the R01 that was just funded in terms of actually providing evidence-based treatment in a black church itself. I'm the PI on that project, but you can see that I have involved the entire community. So thinking about faith leaders, this is Reverend Street who has been supportive of the project and as actually one of their arms, right? So we compare traditional settings of care in an addiction clinic compared to giving treatment in the church. He's the pastor of the church where we're doing this, the, the work. And then these are the two research assistants, Kim Guy, who's in recovery from alcohol and crack cocaine, and also uh, Richard, who is in uh, recovery from alcohol use. Um, all right, y'all, I want to stop because I want to be able to talk some takeaways. Resist, rest, repeat. Resist. Challenge the present addiction system in any way you can. Figure out what you're going to doggedly go after, whether it be policy, whether it be the predominant master narrative, whether it be the ways in which clinical care is executed in addiction and challenge the system really in a way that seeks for liberation and figuring out a different way to bring about care. So support programs like Reach and Lead for sure, as we're trying to shore up the people who are from minoritized communities who can actually take care of the patients. But what are the alternatives that can be created to these master predominant systems? What are ways that non-federally funded programs can be involved in the activism to hold NIDA and NIH accountable to their racist policies. Be very intentional about the teams that you're working with. What do you have control of? How can you hire people that otherwise might not have a seat at the table? How can you empower folks to be more inclusive in their use of their voice? And then when you get done with resisting, you have to rest. Sometimes I forget to rest. I do all this and that, but really being a, deliberate about self-preservation. And I always think about the Audre Lorde quote, you know, self-preservation is the act of political warfare. And one of my mentors, Ruth Shim, she just sent that to me because I was so worn out. So that goes to my second point is surround yourself with people who can remember to tell you to rest. And then you repeat and start resisting. Once you are operating from a place of inspiration and strength, only can you start again. It's hard to deal with folks who have been systematically marginalized, like many folks with addiction have. So you have to be able to have those um, points of self-preservation in place to be able to do the work. And then finally, I'd like to close with a tribute 
to my mentor who unexpectedly died last year. Um, mm, who was a white woman, but an ally truly in supporting the work of liberation and started in her career supporting my work because she knew that the way in which we take care of people with addiction has to be done differently. So I think, thank her for her leadership, her scientific rigor, and I think about her often. So with that, I will close. I'm going to stop. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Oh, thank you so much. What a rich presentation. I don't want to stop. I don't really know. appreciate um, the wealth of like really concrete ideas, but also the spirit and humanity that you brought to it and are encouraging us all to bring to our work. We do have um, a number of questions. I'm just going to read you some of them, Ayana, if that's okay. Please. Okay, let's... Give me a sec. I'm going to get a, uh, a, a tissue. Just give me a sec. Yep. No problem. But I'm here. I'm listening, Joel. Okay, I'm going to read you the first one then, if you can hear. Um, Go ahead. Many of today's attendees are living or working in communities where overdose deaths among Black, Latinx, and, and or Indigenous people are increasing at an alarming rate, even as overdoses among whites are decreasing or stabilizing. What kinds of strategies and policies do you think are needed in these communities to address the disparities in overdose? Black folks are dying and Black and Latinx are dying and what, Jill, sorry, I lost. Um, uh, the question is about the, the increasing overdose rates in uh, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities, yeah. even as rates of overdose are stabilizing in white communities. Right, yeah. And the question is, what kinds of strategies and policies do you think are needed in communities of color to address the disparities in overdose? Well, I think it's not just in terms of communities of color, but yes, we're being disproportionately affected. But in terms of strategies related to drug policy in general, right? So first of all, we have to think about it, making it much easier for folks to be able to get treatment. So I was really um, disappointed because one of the steps in the right direction was Xing the um, regulations on, the, uh, on buprenorphine. And I was like, great, we don't have to do these trainings anymore. It's superfluous, it's ridiculous. It takes eight hours, that's a major barrier. And now we're back where it's in place. So I think one of the things is just making access to the treatment that we know much easier. So getting rid of the policy for buprenorphine, making it easy to get, actually having it covered from all of the uh, treatment programs that are Medicaid funded because there are still people that are getting federal dollars that don't have providers that are actually providing access to this medication. Same thing that we talked about with methadone. I talked about it already. We know that this is a medication that actually um, saves lives, decreases overdose, decreases infectious disease, increases the ability for someone to stay in recovery, hold on job. It's very, very difficult. It's only um, for people with opiate use disorder given at, at opiate treatment programs. We have a study that we're doing. It's called the free methadone study. There's been scholarship in the last month in the context of COVID. That shows when people have access to more exemptions, meaning that they're able to take their medication home with them, they keep it safe, they don't do any um, uh, diversion. So that's one, just making it easy to have access to medication. Then thinking about harm reduction, that's another kind of larger kind of umbrella. What do I mean by that? Meaning that there's no reason why you should be able to leave an addiction program um, primary care clinic and not have access to fentanyl strips, not have access to clean syringes. I just lost a patient last month because she took some dope at a bus stop. Two hours went by before anybody sent her to medical attention and she died, she died unnecessarily. We need access to safe consumption sites. The other places, other countries have them, we don't. This is just easy kind of um, ways in which we can legislate uh, uh, folks to have access to care. I mean, this is just kind of low level things, right? And then thinking about actually incentivizing folks to be able to go into addiction. So what do I mean by that? If people, the pay structure was 
such that primary care docs, addiction docs had um, the level of compensation that people like cardiovascular surgery, dermatology, that has to be totally uh, changed. More people will go into addiction. So there's a lot of things that can happen kind of on the longer term, but I tried to get some things that can happen very quickly that would directly address things like the amphetamine overdose, the uh, opioid overdose, the cocaine overdose, secondary to fentanyl. I mean, these are things that are just very low level. And I'm like, what is the Biden Harris administration doing y'all? Come on. Yeah. You know, so anyway. Thank you. Thank you. And those actually are a lot of issues that, that we're championing at, at DPA. So I'm glad to hear you mention them. Uh, let me just move on. The second question we have is I'm wondering where you think pharmacy students and pharmacists stand in addiction training in the US and where they can fit in uh, the scope of improving practice. Any thoughts for other health professions as well? So thinking yeah. around addiction medicine per se. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I mean, I, there's, a, thank God for pharmacists, but one of the things that um, for sure is that they would be great in, and um, being able to, to dispense methadone, being able to easily uh, respond to what I call these, um, the CTI critical intervention teams that right now are uh, primarily uh, have police involvement and being able to think about how pharmacy and pharmacists can be involved in those um, teams to be able to critically assess when folks have overdoses or need to go out. Um, thinking about uh, how we might just really uh, have interdisciplinary care with like social work and obviously pharmacy and um, nursing and ways in which we can all work together to maximize our skills to be able to train what I call like, not I call, but what folks that, that we use at um, more uh, developing countries like community health workers and being able to impart knowledge. What are the ways in which we're able to safely um, uh, allow folks to know about the pharmacology of the substances that they're using so that they can use safely, right? And those are things that pharmacists could be wonderful in terms of providing education to community health workers that can educate the public. I mean, these are all missed opportunities. What are the ways in which pharmacy can consult with addiction experts to say, you know, don't prescribe benzos with this because you're going to increase the risk of overdose. I mean, these are so many missed opportunities. I see that working best in an inpatient setting, but most folks are not going to make it to an inpatient setting. So why can't we maximize some of those skills? And so we're always thinking about, oh, United States has the best system, but sometimes we can look at lower resource or developing countries to get some ideas of ways of just really collaborating and working to the top of our degrees. So or not even degrees, are at the top of our expertise because everybody has expertise, right? Um, so those are just some thoughts. And again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, although we have to always keep our, our you know, our, our, our knees on the necks of white supremacists, but we definitely need to really think through things that we already know that work and implement them here. And um, collaborative teams is one way to do it. Interdisciplinary collaborative team work. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. I want to get to a, a few more questions. Um, racism and stigma shrouded around addiction are deeply rooted in this country. We see the issues, but, but what do you think we can do to get society to see that research treatment and decriminalization and legalization are key to ending the epidemic we are in today? We have seen a recent glimmer of hope with Oregon. Yeah, no, shout out to Oregon. Thank you so much for whoever um, asked the question. I think that we, you know, um, I'm, I'm missing the quote, Jules, you'll help me, but the arc eventually then the arc of uh, The arc of the universe is you, long, but it bends towards justice. It, thank you, Jules, exactly. Shout out to Re the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. But the point is, is that <clears throat> slowly we're seeing some of the fruits of our labor. And I do think we just have to continue to call out the injustices that we see present 
continue to support organizations like DPA, continue to have these discussions, continue to um, organize and think about ways that we can mobilize grassroots efforts to be able to uh, have accountability um, and push and push and push, push towards justice. Obviously, if you can get easily um, demoralized, which is why I put that rest, resist, repeat, you have to rest. But I think that we're definitely at a place in society where so many folks are affected. We have, it's pushing to do things differently, right? Um, and I think we just have to continue the scholarship. I think the hardest thing is to figure out what you, you as a person can do in your, to either create ways of calling out the problem or ways to work towards the solution. But to do nothing is tragic, right? So if you need to do that with your coins, because you're not an activist, if you need to do that through your scholarship, figuring out what you can do individually or collectively um, to hold people accountable, I think is important. Uh, so that's what I think. I wouldn't do this work unless I thought that there would be a bright ending. I think, I think we're moving towards, but I'm hoping to speed it up. Oh, thank you. And so many great concrete suggestions. Uh, I think this is probably going to be our last question. And I want to um, ask you one that someone had about, about methods. Um, when conducting CBPR and community engaged research in minoritized communities, mm -hmm. how have you handled managing the input and participation of community members who ascribe to the traditional and stigmatizing narratives of addiction? That is, for example, the moral model of addiction or abstinence only recovery, et cetera. Yeah, no, I, I, I welcome it. Like, I don't, there's no, I don't have any um, problem in accepting that. We just say, okay, but how do we, how do we get to keeping people alive and well? I always say like, no, I don't believe addiction is a moral failure. Yes. I think you can use drugs responsibly. Yes, I actually use drugs responsibly. No, I don't think that abstinence is the only way. But for some people, that is what is necessary for their worldview to operate. That is fine. But what are the things that we can agree upon? So my strategy is always to find the commonality in our experience to work towards change. I work in churches. I work in traditional churches. I work in Latinx churches. They are not here for it. They are like, some of these folks are just like, let's pray it away. Fine, let's pray in. Can I give you some Narcan? Let me show you how Narcan works. It's, 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 it's both, not either or. And that allows me, I can't get caught up in, you know, trying to change your mind. We've all been socialized differently. So succinctly, people are gonna believe what they can. How can we agree that folks in our community are dying and what can we do to, to, to make it better? Thank you for that. I think we're gonna um, wrap it up here. I, I just wanna um, say that all of uh, DPA's work is donor funded. And if you're able to contribute, um, we really appreciate it. I'll drop a link on how to do that in the chat, um, but all of our events are free. And so we hope you'll come frequently and often. And again, our, our next um, Drug Researchers Roundtable is on March 25th at 4.30 with uh, David Herzberg, who does a really nice exposition of how white privilege and white supremacy operate in creating um, a legal space for white drug use. Um, so uh, we hope you'll join us for that. And please um, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Jordan for a really rich, wonderful, thought-provoking presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so, so happy. I always say follow me on the socials at Dr. Ayanna Jordan. Um, and I really appreciate the work of DPA and I hope to come back um, once we publish some of the findings. Yeah, we look forward to hearing um, about uh, your new work and we will definitely welcome you back. Thank you. All right, stay safe, everybody. All right, bye-bye.